welcome back off stage radio i'm your host chris schnabel and we are joined by the director of hoop fest here in spokane matt santangelo um so for people that might not be as familiar with you can you tell us a little bit about yourself um i could do it you played at gonzaga you played overseas but i think you could do a better job seeing as you know it's you yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no i uh, uh uh from portland oregon uh youngest of nine kids uh, so big family. Uh, when I was coming playing basketball, my life started third grade, shoot year round in seventh grade. Um, always on some really, really good teams. When I was coming out of high school, um, I was being recruited by um, a handful of different schools. Uh, my final five were Stanford, Rice, Northwestern, uh, University of Oregon, and Gonzaga. Um, I chose Gonzaga, uh, Coach Fitzgerald, who was uh, uh, the longtime coach at the time, and Coach Few recruited me. Coach Few was an assistant coach. Uh, I was uh, So I graduated class of 95 out of high school uh, and then came to GU. Um, Red shirt my first year, um, played under Coach Fitzgerald my freshman year, uh, played under Coach Dan Munson my sophomore and junior year. Um, Sophomore year or junior year, 99 was when we went to the Elite Eight, that first group that um, kind of put the Cinderella on the scene. Uh, and then my senior year was under Coach Few, his first year as head coach. Um, we, we went back to the Sweet 16. So we were, uh, you know, kind of the group that, uh, again, kind of got Gonzaga into the national conversation. Um, went and played overseas for seven years after that, Italy, Spain, Greece, and Poland. Uh, moved back to Spokane when I was done playing ball. Um, I met my wife at GU. She's a SAG as well, um, although neither one of us are from Spokane. And, and now it's home. We got we got three kids: um, uh, high school age, middle school, and grade school. Uh, and that about is the Reader's Digest version. Now this won't be as breaking, but I know you're a big basketball guy. Uh, Nikola Vucevic to the Bulls. How you feel about that? Just now, just announced. <laughs> Just announced. Why well, didn't announced. see that one? I know uh, my my son, who I just dropped out of the school, was all upset this morning because all his social media feeds are just all about rumors about NBA free agency. So he's getting blown up with like this could happen and this could happen. And he was actually, I mean, literally, he voiced his frustration because he's like, "Just tell me when something happens." So the fact that we actually got some action, he'd be excited <laughs> about that. Yeah, it says for Wendell Carter Jr. or uh, Otto Porter and two firsts. Wow. So. Vucevic to the uh, to the Bulls. I'm actually an Orlando fan. Uh, it's 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 a sad life, but I actually an Orlando fan. So I get, I think that's why I got the notification in the first place. Yeah, because <laughs> he's, he's gone. Sorry about that. Well, I thought you'd be in if, that. well, if all the and if all the uh, you know the talk and rumors come to fruition, we should have a flurry of activity happening pretty quick here. Yeah, and a, another one uh, from Orlando. I know Aaron Gordon is. They're looking to. Yep. trade him away to the to the Celtics or something like that but I'm gonna flip right let's flip the switch back so you were around for the beginning <laughs> yeah. of the rise of the Gonzaga basketball and we all know what it is I mean today they're the number one team in the nation what's it feel like to see uh the foundation you guys built become this team again number one team in the nation right now yeah I mean I think you know it's it's definitely something that uh you know, I'm proud of I, I think a lot of old dogs uh former players are really proud of what it's become and but I also feel like this is, uh, you know, just continues to rise. It continues to, be, you know, set new heights and and reach new heights. Um, and so that this old this whole twenty plus year growth has been something that you know we've all kind of been a part of. And I say we all like all the former players and, and uh, you know brotherhood and family of, of former of old dogs um, because every group and every generation has kind of put some their fingerprints on it. You know, everyone has kind of helped move this thing forward to where there's a great sense of uh you know pride and ownership you know ownership and what's happening too i mean it's great that the coaching staff has still been consistent for so long with coach few and tommy floyd um you know certainly brian michelson having going through the program um so it's great to have that continuing relationship um directly with the program and the administration that keeps us close um and helps instill that pride and that ownership and what's happening now, in a normal year, I mean, obviously this year can't happen. In a normal year, how often do you get out to the games? Do you get out, try to get to a lot of them? Do you get to all of them living in the area? Yeah, so uh, I am. So I did my last year on Gonzaga Radio for the, the game broadcast was the national championship run in 2017. 
Um, so at that point I had done, I think seven of eight seasons I was on the radio. So clearly got to do a lot of games uh, yeah. home and away, which was great. But since then, not as many, I mean, as you know, tickets are hard to come by. Um, but also I kind of like, I like watching it from, you know, I like watching them from home because I can, I can really sit and watch them. You don't really have to try to be a fan as much and you just get mm-hmm. to watch the basketball. Um, so I appreciate that, but you know, Gonzaga is great. The network of, of, uh, and community of GU is great. So access to the games, um, you know, it, it, we can get access, but, um, definitely not every single game. It's hard too, cause I got a family of five. So in order for us to go, it's kind of a, it's a heavy lift. Yeah. I, I'm a first year in the master's program. And one thing yeah. I really wish I could see is a packed house at the McCarthy center for a game. And it just haven't been able to, luckily I've been working with the athletic department. So I've been able to watch, the games live because I'm in the building, but it'd be nice yeah. to see a packed house and, and the crowd and the atmosphere. I mean, I've been to college games. So I'm, I'm from the East coast. I'm from New York. I've been to Yukon games and the yep. crowd is probably close to the same, especially back when I was over there and they were very, very good. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it would just be nice to see what the McCarthy center is like when it's live and just rocking and the uh, student sections loud and those yeah. that's like the best part about college sports is all that stuff you know combined together and, and seeing all that and unfortunately it wasn't there but it's building its way back and and that's yeah something we all got to be happy about is things are kind of getting back to normalcy especially with the vaccine going around and stuff like that um after your playing career at gonzaga you went overseas um, how'd you come up with the decision to go overseas was it uh because there weren't many opportunities here or yeah um, so I went through all the pre-draft stuff. I was, uh, you know, went to the uh, pre-draft combine, NBA combine. Um, I sat through the draft. I mean, honestly, I thought I did have an expectation that I was going to get drafted in you know, late second round, but I thought I would get drafted. Um, didn't come to fruition. Um, uh, and so the opportunity was kind of you go through summer league, you know, you could go to, you know, try to get an invite into veterans camp and, you know, and essentially try to make a team. Um, or go take a job. And so I decided that I wanted to, um, you know, I had some really nice opportunities in Europe. That first one was in Greece. Um, It was for, you know, good money. Uh, And I, so I jumped on it. I jumped on the opportunity to kind of travel the world and play ball. Um, And I, and I don't, I got no, uh, you know, uh, no great disappointment or regrets around that because, you know, I could have clawed my way maybe into, um, uh, you know, some NBA experience, but I probably never was going to be a, uh, you know, get to a lot of playing time where in Europe, I was a big contributor on a lot of very successful teams and, um, you know, felt like my game grew as I matured and I became a better basketball player for it. And I got paid to do it. So man, That's... we're really, we're, we're really splitting hairs here on the, the path of, uh, uh, because I was very fortunate to, to get paid to play a game. And when you went overseas, how did you, um, how did you get there in the first place? Did you have to contact teams? Did you get through an agency or something like that? Just for people who might be trying to do that. Yep. So I got recruited by an agent here, a local agent in the United States, as I was, you know, again, aspiring to play in the NBA or aspiring to, let's just say aspiring to play professionally. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, I had built up, I had enough career, enough of a career and kind of resume that agents were recruiting me um, to sign with their agency. And then they put a lot of that stuff in motion. Uh, So it was, it was relatively, uh, you know, relatively straightforward in that sense. I didn't, I wasn't trying to go to European tryouts or I didn't have to call teams. Like there, there were, I would kind of, again, had the, uh, uh, career resume that had opened up some opportunities for me. Now, and, and this is kind of off topic a little bit, but it's on topic now agencies, uh, these days and the big one that's coming into, uh, going around is the one that Fernando Tati signed with. They, pay the players beforehand so they have money and then when they get money back it's a certain percentage how do you feel um about stuff like that with players like how tatis got that huge deal and he owes them in the hundreds or he owes them like 30 million dollars or something like that of the money he gets do you think that's fair for players because you when they're coming up most of them some of them don't have anything so they're getting money there but i mean i think they gave fernando tatis a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars and he has to pay him back 30 million dollars for that do you have any opinion on that or well i haven't if that's the case if that's the math i'd like to understand the math behind that deal a little better because it was make any sense it was yeah, so I mean, they gave him money when he first got into the league which yeah, again yeah. Does, it doesn't make any sense because fernando tatis was his dad <laughs> you know fernando tatis jr but it's up for multiple people but then when 
uh, he signed a big contract. They get he they get a certain percentage of the contract that he yeah. signed that four hundred or was it three hundred and fifty four hundred fifty million dollar contract. Yes, I mean if he turned a hundred thousand dollar loan into a thirty million dollar payout, <laughs> that's not good business for one. If that's the case, um, two, I don't mind the the loaning of player. You know, the loaning of money or like fronting players' money until they get paid because you know that summer in between. You know, when you're done playing your last season and you're, you know, you're a professional, you incur costs. I mean, you're traveling yeah. around, you're, you're trying to work out, you're, you know, you're, you're trying to make that step um, physically through training and nutrition. Um, you know, some people need just, like, like you said, have some basic needs that need to be met. Now, if an agency wants to front that money and get paid back on the back end, as long as it's a fair loan, like that's all good because, you know, it's a, you know, and, and just, it's, it's just a nice courtesy and a nice service. And not that out of the, out of the normal, out of the norm. Um, It's when players get, you know, taken advantage of and that kind of thing. And then I, I I think you just follow the money. People don't just give money away. So the people that have money, if they're paying uh, professional athletes, more than likely if they own the rights to pay a professional athlete, they're making more money and they'll, and the market is determining how much money they can pay the athlete. So I don't, I don't have a problem and I don't have a problem with NCAA either. They got to kind of figure it out because they make a ton of money from specifically men's basketball. Um, and so the, the talent that is producing that revenue, which are the athletes, um, you know, should participate in some way. Uh, and I know the college education is great, but they're making enough money to pay for their scholarship. And, and it's not like, Oh, but they get their college paid for. Well, yeah, great. But if they're producing a million dollars, they shouldn't just get, it Gonzaga 50 grand to pay for Gonzaga. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, there's still a disparity there and there's more money to be had. If there's not more money, that's fine. You know, if the market doesn't, doesn't produce more revenue or, or bear more economic impact, then there's no argument. Um, but the value is there. And I think that's, that's where the um, uh, athletes need to be treated fairly. It's funny that you say uh, if they produce, if they get a million dollars, maybe they should get more. Cause I am, positive it's more than a million dollars that basketball and football can like are making i'm pretty sure the ncaa tournament was in the billions the tv yeah. deal and, and I, some of that's got to go offset other sports like i get it you know that part is you know important you're not you know you're not getting dollar for dollar on your value because you're benefiting from this overall structure of the ncaa to an extent um however like the argument is like they're getting an education paid for well they've earned that you know, they've earned the right to get their college education paid for and then some because they, you know, that, you know, certain schools are producing so much money. Yeah. And it, exactly. said certain schools are producing so much money and certain sports are producing so much money as well. Like you said, basketball and college football, especially down south, produces yeah. some some schools stay alive because of their football program. And it's just. I, you know, there's so many opinions on it. I think that athletes should get some sort of compensation. Um, even if it's just the, the rights deal that they keep talking about, like where they can use their rights to do video games and, and sell off their memorabilia. And I know that's a big thing. A lot of, you see a lot of college players, especially in the mid two thousands are getting in trouble because they're trying to sell off memorabilia, but it's like, it's, it's theirs, you know, it's theirs. They own it. They if they want to sell it. Like it, if a professional athlete does it makes they can do it it's fine but the ncaa definitely has a lot of things to figure out it's they they're pretty uh corrupt system when it comes to the student athletes that are literally their product if if every student athlete decided to to say you know what we're not playing ncaa would shake in their boots they would have no idea what to do because they would just lose so much money and they, there's nothing they can do if the players just decide to stop but yeah it'd be, it'd be interesting to see that develop over the next uh, you know next couple of years but i do think they're on a path to for some significant changes and it's, it's about time they are because they've made a lot a lot a lot of money on people that have, have played for them in the whatever hundred years they've been around a couple hundred years they've been around whatever it is um so you're the director of hoop fest which is a huge tournament here in spokane washington now i'm i'm originally from new york and until i got here last year i've actually never heard of hoop fest obviously it's the other side of the country and everything so can you talk a little bit about hoop fest for people like myself that may not have known what it was or may not know what it is going into it yep Yep. so hoop fest is the world the world's largest even new york can't compete with it i'll throw that one out there (laughs) And no big surprise that someone from New York has no idea what's going on anywhere else but New York. Um, <laughs> but it is the world's largest three-on-three basketball tournament. So it is uh, It's the last weekend in June every year but COVID years. 
um, and it's we'll be celebrating our 32, 32nd birthday, you know, 32nd anniversary this year in 2021. And so it's been around for a long time. Uh, it brings about 6,000 teams, 24,000 athletes, about 250,000 people to downtown Spokane, Washington over the weekend. Uh, generates about a $50 million economic impact to our region. So imagine the Super Bowl each and every year, um, but here in, in, you know, in Spokane. Uh, we are the organization that's been built around it is a nonprofit. So there's only six full-time staff. Uh, and then, it, you know, we really do the work on the shoulders of about 3,000 volunteers to help us execute the weekend. Wow. Um, and it's just an awesome community event. It's about three square miles uh, when we set it up, um, about 420 plus basketball courts, about 14,000 games on the weekend. And everyone from like second grade, people who just, you know, graduated from second grade to, I think in 2019, our oldest athlete was a 78 year old and everything in between um, from people who play basketball every day to people who haven't played basketball since last hoop fest to people who've never played basketball before and they're just signing up. So it's, it's every walk of life. It's our most diverse, our most vibrant, our most inclusive weekend of the year. Um, and it's just an awesome, like it is Disneyland for basketball. It's just what it is. And it's, it's weird that it, I think it's a little strange that it happens in Spokane, uh, being that, that, but it's a, it's an organic, natural, authentic Spokane thing. Uh, that's really, really special. So in addition to that, we run youth programs. We have one of the largest AAU clubs in the country here in Spokane, Washington. Um, we have a high school age traveling club team, Eastern Washington elite. We have an outreach program with our public school district called Ignite Basketball. We have built roughly about 32 park courts in our region, um, made the reinvestment into the, into the region for park courts. Um, our primary beneficiary is Special Olympics. We do a lot with Special Olympics in the state of Washington. So proceeds that we earn from the event and our program go on to Special Olympics. Um, I mean, it's a basketball community, basketball organization that's doing a ton. And we just recently in 2019 launched the Hooptown USA Initiative um kind of an interesting story i think because yeah a few years ago the city of spokane rebranded our visitors bureau it's called this spokane rebranded the city and they asked hoop fest as a stakeholder in the community like what do you think we stand for and so as we've been talking about i have a, a unique perspective in the fact that i'm not from spokane so i come from other somewhere else but i have a great tie to gonzaga basketball and now i have a great tie to hoop fest and community basketball and there's not a day that goes by that I don't talk about basketball in some way, shape, or form, you know, especially this time of year um, with the Gonzaga success and March Madness uh, by itself. But, um, and so I said, listen, we care more about basketball in our community than we should. Like, we love basketball. Um, you know, the most impassioned fan base for Gonzaga basketball isn't the Kennel Club. It's like the retirement community. It's the adults in the community that, that really love Gonzaga um, and help support um, you know, on campus, the on campus uh, dynamic of Gonzaga basketball. What really makes Hoop Fest so special, uh, literally a world class event, are the volunteers. So now we're talking about how sport connects people, like how basketball in our community brings us together, how you and I are having a conversation because I played basketball 20 years ago at GU, right? Other than that, you wouldn't have called me. Like, you don't even know the history as well. You're brand new to this thing. So, like, you wouldn't have called me if it wasn't for my connection to basketball. But that's the power of sport is it brings people together. And that's what the Hooptown USA initiative is all about. It's literally about elevating our collective community identity um, and articulating how important basketball is and why we are unique as a community. Because we can do things like Hoop Fest. We can do things like Gonzaga basketball. But it's beyond that. Whitworth competes for national championship. Eastern's on the rise. High school basketball wins state. You know, we have multiple state champions each and every year from this side of the state. Um, I mean, you go down the line, there's a lot of reasons why we can say we are a Hooptown USA. We are a Hooptown USA. Um, and that's really the, the um, you know, in addition to the event of Hoop Fest, that's kind of our mission is to, to elevate the sport of basketball, the connections that the sport makes in our community from our organization. So, I want to go back to one of the first things you said that you you find it odd that's in Spokane, Washington. Why is it in Spokane, Washington? Like, how did it start yeah. in Spokane, Washington? Yeah, so I mean, three on three basketballs are prevalent in every community. I mean, New York has them too. New York probably has them in multiple boroughs. Like, mm -hmm. it's 
um, you know, the Gus Macker, Hoop It Up, or really uh, big three-on-three organizations that have a lot of smaller events, but it ain't nothing like Hoop Fest, like 6,000 teams. It just, it ain't nothing, it's nothing like it. And so um, I think Spokane is uniquely positioned because we have to create our own fun. And I actually take real pride in what Spokane has been able to accomplish and the fact that I get to be a part of this organization um, because Spokane has got to create its own fun. We don't have, you know, a professional sports franchise. You know, Gonzaga is the closest thing we got. Um, we don't have where we're going and watching, uh, I don't know, we have Broadway shows, but we don't, we're not going and watching all these different things. Spokane is like a participatory town. We like to do things. Like, we don't like to just go watch things. We like to be a part of it. That's why Balloons Day at one time was the largest road race in the, in the world at 65,000 runners. That's why Hoop Fest is what Hoop Fest is. It's because we like to go do things and, and participate. Um, and I think that's what makes us unique. I think we're also at a really great size because you can make an impact here, but we're all connected. Like, we're, we're small enough to all be connected, but we're big enough for, like, mass impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Spokane is uniquely positioned for that. We're not competing against the next borough where, we, you know, we ain't talking to the Bronx and we ain't talking, you know, it's like, this is, we're all in this thing together. And so we all kind of take pride in that too. So I think we're a unique size and kind of that unique mentality of we want to participate. We just don't want to watch people. And that's why I love about Hoop Fest because March Madness, like we're watching the talent, right? We're watching Gonzaga play. We're watching all these teams compete, uh, men and women, and we're loving March Madness. Well, normal in a normal year, right after March Madness is Hoop Fest season. So now we go from watching to now you and I are the talent. You know, you and I are, are you know, either living our glory days or reliving our glory days, or maybe this is the biggest stage we ever get to play on is at Hoop Fest with 250,000 people around us. You know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. it's a completely different attitude than we just buy a ticket and go watch someone else. No, it's like, we get to, we get to be a part of this. We get to live that. We get to feel that energy. Uh, and we get to take ownership in that. Um, and I think that is unique to Spokane. Now, with all the participants, are there also people that do, like, are, is it a ticketed event as well? Or is it you come in, if you want to watch, you could just watch? Yep, you come in and just watch. So that we get, so, you know, with 24,000 athletes, we go, because it's not ticketed, we go about three and a half, four fans to one athlete, you know, families mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. So that's how we get 125,000 people on Saturday and then 125,000 people on Sunday. Uh, that are in downtown in this and it's all free to the public like it's just you pay to play we schedule that out we we build the brackets we you know we make that playing experience the best we can uh, but other than that it's a festival you know from food from food experience to music to other entertainment um to all those great sponsor activations um those just kind of make that festival feel around the tournament you you know I again we went back to I would wish to see the kennel pop in with uh with basketball now I'm like man I wish this happened I I you, I, I, I really wish I could have been there and, and played seen it all and just be a part of this whole thing, um which this year in September it got pushed back a little bit it's going to be happening but I want to talk about last year's really quick because it went virtual because yeah. obviously we all know why it went virtual yeah, we don't really have to talk yeah. about it but it went virtual how did it go virtual. Yeah, so basketball's hard to go virtual. That's yeah, the true a thing. Bit. You know, that is a tough thing. But what we did is we found this awesome technology, a mobile app called Home Court. And Home Court is an artificial intelligence, uh, basically a basketball training tool where you are on the screen and you're going through your ball handling and it's giving you targets. You know, it's tracking your shots. It's doing a lot of different contests. So it's a, this mobile app that we reached out to. And it wasn't built for anything like we, what we wanted to do with it. But it gave us a platform. And they were uh, great enough to kind of work with us as a partner to develop some things specifically for us. So what, the, what we looked at is we looked at other like uh, events, specifically road races, running races. And you know, running races were a little bit more dynamic. You say, hey, you know, go run your, you know, your 5K and just report your time and you'll get a finalist shirt and you'll kind of participate with us virtually. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, basketball is a lot harder to do that, especially team basketball is a lot harder to do that. So what we did is we used this technology to offer four challenges. So what would have been Hoop Fest weekend, which we postponed to August last year, um, we did four challenges. And if you complete, if you signed up for it, you got the Hoop Fest player shirt, which is a big deal because we all play just for t-shirts. 
And if you completed the four challenges, you get the championship shirt. So every year. So what happened was we got a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't play in Hoop Fest participate. One example is my wife. My wife's never played in Hoop Fest, but last year she got to participate and be a Hoop Fest champion because she completed the four challenges. And we were able to push those challenges out through this home court app um, that I think is pretty slick. I think the technology is really slick. Uh, and so that was how we were able to do something because what we don't want to do, which we may, you know, we may need to, but we didn't want to do it is just do like a fundraiser. We didn't want to say like, hey, everyone save Hoop Fest because a lot of our business is dependent upon that one weekend out of the year. Yeah. I mean, we're about a, you know, budget wise, yeah, it's about 98% of our budget is that one year or one weekend, excuse yeah. me. So um, we wanted to be able to create value and provide something the best we could do in a virtual world. And that home court solution was what we found. So what was the the build to that? So, you know, you, you think you're coming in, you're going to do Hoop Fest in June, and then boom, COVID hits. And you're like, well, it's not going to happen in June. We could push it back. Then boom, you can't do that. And then you go virtual. <laughs> what what were the steps that led to each each one there? Yeah, I mean, basically it was, it was, it was that. I mean, it was out of our control. We were watching it every day. I felt like at some one point I felt like I was like a professional health official because I knew every <laughs> little bullet point and nuance. And like, you know, I do a lot of uh, – um, uh, you know, at least local media explaining those different steps so we can educate the market on what's going on. Um, and so like I knew, like I said, knew all the bullet points. We planned multiple styles of events. We planned socially distance events. We planned uh, reduced capacity. We, I mean, we did, had all these versions of plans that we were just working on all year because we worked really hard to hold the event. Like we competed just like people come to Hoop Fest and compete. We competed to hold the event last year. And so it was just kind of, it was like everyone else, it was just so tough because you kept waiting for good news. You kept waiting for good news and it just kind of never came, never came, never came. And then you would take like, you would take heat to people like, you can't have Hoop Fest. This is the dumbest idea ever. And you're going like, well, we can plan for Hoop Fest. Like we're not putting anyone at risk by the planning. Mm -hmm. And when we get closer to those dates, if it's not safe to come outside and play basketball, like we're not going to come outside and play basketball. We're not going to defy the guidelines that are provided. So it's kind of just answering all those questions, all those questions, all those questions. And at the same time, trying to do fun stuff. So one of the unique things about last year that was a benefit was normally we're on, we're on kind of, uh, we have about a three month season, you know, from when registration starts in March to the end of June, four month season, um, when Hoop Fest. Well, now we had all summer long. I mean, we started in March and we kind of went through, I mean, really December. And we tried a lot of different stuff from basketball distribution to home court to, our a vert, a kind of a, a socially distanced Toyota shoot off, which is a contest we run. So it actually gave us a lot more uh, calendar to do cool stuff. And then we got such great support from our sponsors. We got such great support from teams that had registered. Uh, we got great support on the virtual tournament, the virtual event. We got great support on our merch um, and, and e-commerce and retail. And, and all those things together was, gave us enough success um, that we live to play another day that we survived in advance to 2021. That's great. And then in 2021, it's going to be September 11th and 12th. If anybody's looking to, to get on to that. So, uh, the hoop fest tournament itself, is it one big, uh, division or are there different tiers? Like, is there the yep. tiers of kids that played and stuff like that? And then down it goes or. <laughs> so you and I sign up if two buddies, what we'll do is we'll take the average age and the average height of our team, and then we'll group us together with other teams that are basically this average height and average age. So at Hoop Fest, if we have 422 courts, we'll probably have 470 brackets, like individual bracket tournaments. So you'll have 470 champions at Hoop Fest, if that makes sense. So it's like all these little tiny tournaments just all played at the same time all over the place. So it's really a unique. So it's like, you know, if you're if we're a third grade team, we're playing against other third grade teams. If we're a co-ed team, we're playing against other co-ed teams. And we may just win our bracket. And we have from recreational, competitive, and then elite bracket divisions as well. That's amazing. And uh, one last question. If you had advice to somebody trying to make a career in basketball, not like playing, but like trying to make their career in basketball like yeah. you have, what advice would you give them? I mean, most you see a lot of former players try to get into broadcasting or analysts or something like yeah. that, but you've kind of made a career in a different way by doing Hoop Fest. So what advice would you give somebody like that? 
So I think my advice, if you want to get in sports, is really find those local organizations or groups that are doing the sport that you want to be a part of and volunteer, or maybe not even the sport you want to be a part of. Maybe it's a, a sports commission. Maybe it's a, a, you know, a youth club. Maybe it's, um, you know, in Spokane, maybe it's a hoop fest where you really can see behind the scenes as to the work that's necessary to do in order to have, you know, successful sports in your, you know, in your town, in your community. I think that that experience alone is really valuable. And again, you can get to uh, hoop fest September 11th and 12th. You can sign up at spokanehoopfest.net. Um, you can also go on Instagram and go to Spokane hoop fest on either of those and find that Matt, you thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we, I, you know, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be <laughs> yeah. there. I'm not the best basketball player in the world, but the way you talked about it got me so fired up that I will, I will find a team and get out there. Yeah. Being good is completely irrelevant. It's an afterthought. This is about coming together with friends and family and just having fun in a great environment. I mean, you just being a sports guy, just being downtown, you'll love it. I mean, we've awesome. had from Kevin Durant to ESPN to all of our Nike connections and relationships, you know, every year is the same. They kind of go like, Oh man, I got, I, why am I going to Spokane? Like, I don't get it. And then they show up for Hoop Fest. They're like, oh, my gosh, this is a real thing. And I'm going like, yeah, this is a real thing. Like, this is world class. So, yeah, you got to see it to believe it. Uh, but once you see it, you'll love it. I am I am so pumped for it to do it again. That's September 11th and 12th. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you taking time. Yep. Thank you. And you can follow Offstage at off.stage.radio on Instagram, Offstage Radio on Twitter, Offstage Radio on Facebook. You can also find us on the Isaac website. Uh, we are right there, Offstage Radio. You can also find us on Schnabel Productions. That's S-C-H-N-A-B-E-L productions.com slash Offstage Radio. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matt, for joining us. And we will be back next week with another great guest, Softstage Radio. Radio.